Hello everybody and welcome to Creating Better Spreadsheets with Microsoft Excel. Just one note about using ReadyTalk. If you have any questions today, you can go ahead and chat those into the chat pane. If you lose your Internet connection at any time, you can reconnect using the link that was emailed to you, so just the way you did right now. And I did put a number in there into the chat pane if you need to call in. It should be, go, it should be um, playing through your mic and speakers automatically. And just as a reminder, we are going to be recording today's session, and the archive of the recording will be up via a Creative Commons license later, um, probably next week. Um, but we will be sending out the recording to you later today along with the presentation and materials and links. And if you do want to go ahead and talk about this via Twitter, you can do so on the Twitter hashtag. And so again, welcome to Creating Better Spreadsheets with Microsoft Excel. I'm Kyla Hunt. I'm going to be your facilitator today. I'm the Webinar Program Manager with TechSoup Global. And with us today is Mark Liu, from, also from TechSoup. He's going to be talking with us a little bit about keyboard shortcuts and pivot tables. And we also, from Microsoft, have Kate Liberstein, um, who is going to be talking about the organization Feet First and a little bit about how she used Excel to help them with their strategic scorecard. So again, first up, we're going to have keyboard shortcuts from Mark Liu. And so in just one second, I'm going to go ahead and give it over to him to get started. Again, if you do have any questions, go ahead, type those into the chat pane, and I will go ahead and um, we will go ahead and respond. And for some reason, we do not get to your question. Never fear. We will be um, following up with any unanswered questions today. And if in your confirmation email or reminder email, we did send out the link for the captioning of this webinar. I will go ahead and put that link into the chat pane if for some reason you do not have access to that email. Okay, thanks. And at this point, I'm going to give it over to Mark. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so um, hi everybody. Thank you, Kyla. I'm Mark Will. I'm with TechSoup. And I will be talking about keyboard shortcuts and pivot tables. And let's see. Uh, so I'll talk about what are the advantages and disadvantages of keyboard shortcuts and how to learn about them. And when I do pivot tables, I'll talk about when to use them and then do a demo of the usage of pivot tables. Now, Kyle has inserted a survey in here. And I just wanted to ask people, how often do you use keyboard shortcuts in Microsoft Excel? Frequently, occasionally, or never? And so uh, I see we're getting responses. They're up to 100 already. How do we do this, Kyla? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it looks like you want to meet yourself really quick, Mark. All right, so it does look like we're getting a lot of responses. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And it does look like 43% um, of you use it occasionally. 34% um, of you or 35% of you never use keyboard shortcuts, so that's really good for us to know. And 22% of you use it frequently. So um, that's really great, I think, for us to know for Mark going into his uh, keyboard shortcuts section. So thanks, guys. Okay, so I see a lot of you use them already. So um, maybe you're here for to hear about pivot tables <laughs> because it's not it's pretty straightforward where keyboard shortcuts are. Um, the idea is that instead of using the mouse and menus, like going to the mousing over to the edit menu and then clicking on edit and then mousing down to copy and clicking on copy, then you just use a shortcut like you hold down the control key and press C, and that's the copy shortcut. Or alternatively, for file, if you want to open a file, you go to the file menu and then click on that and then go to open and click on that. The keyboard shortcut is Alt key, hold that down, and then the letter F, and then hold the Alt key and then the letter O. Um, so it's so here the next page are some examples of very commonly used shortcuts. So the most common editing 
commands are copy, paste, and cut. And so those are set up as control X, control C, and control V. Another one that's very useful in Excel is select all, which is control A. That will select every cell on your sheet. <coughs> Um, another very useful one is undo the last operation that you did, the last editing operation, which is Control Z. Um, and then some other basic ones are Open File, Save File, and Close File. And those are Alt F, Alt Zero, or O, not Zero, Letter O, Alt F, Alt S, and Alt F, Alt C. And you can see there's a pattern. Um, they try to use letters that make sense. So F, Alt F is for File. And then O, S, and C are for open, save, and close. Uh, it doesn't always follow that convention because I think there's limits to the alphabet, but it's pretty common to have hints like that to help you remember. So, what are the advantages of using keyboard shortcuts? I use Excel very heavily myself. I spend probably a couple hours a day in Excel. And I find that using keyboard shortcuts for me is very valuable because it's easily twice as fast as using the mouse. And why is that? It's because rather than using, uh, moving the mouse and pressing key several keys like move the mouse, press, move the mouse, press, uh, you just click one or two keys. And you also don't have to move your hand back and forth. Um, I'm a touch typist, as probably many of you are, and I like to keep my hands on the keyboard so I don't lose the, the home pl placement of my fingers. So if I'm moving my hand back and forth from one to the other, then I can lose it. And it just simply takes time to move my hand to the mouse and back. It takes a whole second. But if I'm spending hours in Excel, uh, those seconds add up. And that's why I think it's, it's twice as fast. And also, it just simply takes less precision. If your hand's already in the touch typing position, you can find the keys very reliably without even thinking about it. You're sort of programmed into your muscles by then. But if you're using the mouse, you actually have to place the mouse, the, the cursor over an icon or place it over the menu. You have to get it in the right spot. You actually have to have some eye-hand coordination. And for some people like me, that's a little bit demanding. So I'd rather not have to do that. So that's the basic ideas. What are the disadvantages? Well, the main disadvantage why a lot of people don't use keyboard shortcuts is that you simply you need to learn and remember the letter combinations. Um, and very often people just don't want to bother. They've already got too much stuff in their brains, and this doesn't seem worth it. But the good thing about it is it's not all or nothing. You don't have to always use keyboard shortcuts. You can use them when you feel like it, and you cannot use them when you don't feel like it. So if you're just casually get into Excel for a few minutes, you don't have to bother. But if you're going to spend, spend an hour in Excel, for the next hour in Excel, it might be worth it to refresh your memory and start using the keyboard shortcuts during that session because you're going to be spending a lot of time. And you don't have to worry about whether you'll remember tomorrow. All you have to do is learn it for today. So how do we learn about them? Um, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet. And before I open it up, uh, this is an example strategy. Just, I just happened to be working with this data myself, so I used it. Uh, it's the IRS Business Master File of Nonprofit Organizations. So this is publicly available data. Uh, as nonprofits, all of our organizations, this information that the IRS makes available to anybody. And I, in fact, went to this, this URL that I've got pr printed here and downloaded the data myself as if I was somebody in the public. I didn't need to log in or anything like that. There's about 1.5, over 1.5 million nonprofit organizations. I just pulled a random sample of 1,000 records. I mean, it's not even random. Like I grabbed the first 1,000 rows or something like that. And um, I'll show you how you get to see key tips. So let's go to shared desktop. Oh, it works. Okay, so this is my spreadsheet. Uh, this is my example. So like here's the names of some organizations. Uh, here is their employer identifier number. It's a unique number for every organization. Every business or nonprofit has a number like that. And if I scroll down, and I'm using keyboard shortcuts, that's why you don't see the mouse moving. I have a thousand. I'm in row 1001, so there's a thousand records in here. And this file has a whole bunch of different fields describing. Uh, let's see, it goes all the way over to column AF, so there's about 30 columns of data. And it has assets and income. Um, it has a name, doing business as, address, city, state, zip code. 
uh, column I is the 501C number, so the subcategorization. So these are these are threes, which is public charities. And then down here I've got a 501C4 and a 501C5. So there's different kinds of nonprofits. They're not all charities. So this is an example of a, uh, just a spreadsheet. Okay? So key, key tips tell you what the keyboard shortcuts are. So the way to see the key tips is to press down the Alt key, and you can see up at the top there are these little icon squares with uh, letters inside. So F is, file is F, home is H, insert is N, and there's an example where it's not I. They probably had I reserved for something else. Page layout is T. So if I hit S now, I'm holding the Alt key. It goes to the file pay, uh, command set of commands. Okay, and here again I've got key tips. S is for save, save as is A, open is O, and C is close. And so all I've done is I'm I've been holding the, the Alt key this entire time. Now if I hit A, it will bring up the Save As dialog. Not that I really want to save it. I just wanted to show you. So that's key tips. So you can learn your, your keyboard shortcuts just by holding down the Alt key, and it tells you how to get to them. So you can do Alt. N for insert. And now, like for example, if I want to do a line graph, it's going to be an, another N. If I want to do a column graph, it's going to be a C. If I want to insert a picture, it's a T. So you can learn what they are just by doing this and, and paying attention to those little key tips, and then you can reuse it. Okay? So that's how you see the key tips. I've got to double click here. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's some control short, uh, shortcuts which are used the control key. Uh, those are faster because you only need one letter usually. Those are still supported by Excel. Um, these have been around in Excel for a long time, but they're not visible through the key tips. The key tips only show you the Alt uh, keyboard shortcuts. So you can get this information from going to Excel Help. To get to Excel Help, you can use the F1 function key, or there's a Help icon. It's a little uh, circle with a question mark inside. Search for keyboard shortcuts, and there's an article called Keyboard Shortcuts in Excel. And we're planning to make a URL to this article available to you. And it's like a five-page article that tells you all the different shortcuts and gives you a lot more information. So this is just an introduction. Uh, I want to like show you what they are and how they can speed things up. But I'm not going to try and teach you the shortcuts because there's literally hundreds of them. So now I'm going to move on to pivot tables. And so we have another survey. And the question is, how often do you use pivot tables in Microsoft Excel? Frequently, occasionally, or never? And somehow I guess that the answers will be different this time than they were for keyboard shortcuts because pivot tables are a relatively advanced function. And we're waiting to see people's responses. They're still coming in. You want to do this, Kyla? Sure. All right, we're going to go ahead and close it in five, four, three, two, one. And so it looks like 84% of you have never used pivot tables, and so that's really great for us to know. 14% 14, 14 of you occasionally use it, and only 2% of you, about 2% of you, frequently use it. So that's really great for us to know that you are mostly all beginners at this. All right, so go ahead and check. Okay, so we had four people who said they frequently use them. If I had voted myself, it would be five because I use them constantly. I use them all the time. Um, so what are they? What you need is a tabular array of data. And typically, I mean, you could use it with two rows of data, but I don't think people would find it very helpful in that case. So you would be talking about hundreds of rows of data, up to a million rows because Excel will allow a million rows in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and the way you bring it up is to do insert pivot table, pivot table. Those are the menu options. And uh, when do you use them? So that's why I brought up this example of the IRS Business Master File. You use it when you have lots of data. 
You have data fields to summarize, things that you might want to sum up or average. So an example of a data field in the IRS is simply like the one of the fields was income, another one was assets. You have categorization rows for columns and rows and filters. So these are things like the state or the 501C subgroup. Okay. They are good for presentation because in that example of the IRS business master file, you just have this massive spreadsheet with many, many, many rows of data, and it's hard to see anything in it because there's just so much data. A tabular view, view which is like uh, a two-way table, is very intuitive. People are very used to looking at them, uh, and that's what a pivot table produces for, for you. And it's very well integrated with Excel graphs, and it's really good for exploration. So like an ex that example, um, you might be wondering, are the nonprofits in Maine different from the nonprofits in Florida? Uh, or which subject section like IRS 501C3 versus 4 has the highest income? These are questions you might be wondering about, and you can use the pivot table to answer them. Uh, so let's go into it. Uh, the, uh, the, so the type of data you have. So you, in typically in a pivot table, each row represents a different instance of the data event. So the kind of data I work with at TechSoup Global is I look at, we, we have a big product donation program, and I'll get tables where each row in the, pivot, in the data represents one donation. So it will say who was donated to, what the product was, how many copies of the product, what was the retail value of the product, the date, that the donation was given. So that's what I use. I know the, the kind of things that we do at TechSoup is not that typical of nonprofits, but the kind of things that you might see yourselves are things like uh, you might have one row representing a client who is using your services and his use of the services, his or her. Or it might be one donation to your organization. Or one row might be one volunteer performing an activity for your organization or it might be one client participating in an activity being offered by your organization. So that's the kind of information you have in, the row, in each row. Then the columns, you have different fields to describe the event. So typically you'll have something like a date and a time. You have inf identification information as who is the client or donor or volunteer or participant. Um, maybe address information, telephone number, email address, contact information things describing a participant. Um, you might have information about the type of service. In my example, it was uh, what is a product? I mean, probably what is a product name and what is the, uh, the catalog, catalog number we have for it. But you know, it might be different services or activities that your organization is involved in. And then there will be quantities. Uh, for me, number of products requested. For you, it might be the number of services used, or the size of the donation, or the amount of time the volunteer gave, or the number of activities the volunteer was involved in. And each column must have a heading. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, and so the result is a tabular summary of the data. The text of global, um, and for me, it's like donations by country by month. Or you might be interested if you're an organization that has multiple locations, how many services were offered in each location, or the number of donations by different donation type by week, or the number of volunteers from an affiliate by month. These are the kinds of reports you might get with a pivot table. So I'm going to go into Excel, and here, here's my data. So the first thing I'm going to do is select all my data. So I'll do Control A. Now everything has been selected. And I'll go Alt A for data. Uh, where was it? I don't usually use this one. Um, v I think. Oh no, that's the wrong one. All right, I'll start over. I'll do it the way I usually do it. Um, D P. No, I doubled it. Alt D P. Okay. Okay, so I've had my data selected, 
And here it's set me up for a pivot table. The pivot table is going to appear on the left, and over on the right are, is a sort of a wizard kind of device of, of thing. And so what I'm going to do is just take the field name and drop it down into values, and it says count of name. So this is the piece of, a piece of data I'm going to get in this, in this pivot table. So, so I have 1,000 different organizations. And then maybe I'll go to income just to try another thing. And you can see I can put in two different things. So sum of income. So the total income of these 1,000 organizations was I'm, these are dollars. So this is like 3,526. So these, this, these, they have an average income of $3.5. So this is a pretty low income group of organizations. Uh, let's see what it says for assets. Assets. So I had assets of 3,000. I can also change these here. Uh, if I click on this little down arrow, then I got this menu and it says value field settings. I click on that. And you can see these are different kinds of computations that the pivot table can do for you. So I've already had sum. I've already had count. So I can show average. Let's click on OK. So now I've got an average assets is three. Three. This is all. This is also money. So this is three dollars and eighty-two cents. So that's. So you can see you can put different values into your pivot table, <coughs> and then it gives you a ability to do this by rows and columns. So let's say let's pull up state and put that in the rows, and we can see in my data. I have the states of California, Colorado, District of Columbia, Florida, and so on. <coughs> and it just so happens out of my thousand organizations, this group was very heavily uh, oriented towards the state of Maine. That was just the, the random collection I got. Uh, that doesn't mean that Maine is the nonprofit capital of the United States. It's just the collection I pulled up. And let's go to that subgroup number. So let's do uh, – let's put that here. So I see I have um, names. I have different subgroups, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 92. Right here, this column is subgroup 3. So these are the charities. And out of the 1,589 were charities. Um, let's see. I don't even know what subgroup 7 is, but there were 90 of those. So that was relatively common. Okay. And if I look at this cell right there, there were 549 501c3s uh, in the state of Maine out of 1,000. So almost a little over half of all 1,000 were there. And over here in this set of columns, and continuing, these are the income for the, for the nonprofits in those states and subgroups. And over here, we have the average assets. Okay, and so the, the number formatting is not very good, but uh, I could fix that. That looks a little bit more reasonable. But this is a very complicated, sort of messy pivot table. I was just trying to show you some features. These are not a likely combination. Let me just get rid of some of these things. I'll get rid of income, and I'll get rid of assets. So that's, that's a more typical kind of view that you would have. So, that's, so you can see you can set things in different places. I can move. I can switch. I can put the subgroups in the rows and the states in the columns. And it takes, took me one second to do that. So I can adjust the display to be something that works for me that's more intuitive. I'm going to go back now. Um, I can add more rows. So for example, I can put city under state. And I can see for California, I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six different cities. Los Alamitos, Los Angeles, Roma Land, San Diego, San Mateo, and Soledad. So there are only seven organizations in this data set of 1,000 from California, and they were spread over six different cities. Now, of course, if I go down to Maine, I'm going to see a lot of cities because I had a lot of data from Maine. 
Those are all main cities. Okay, so you can have any number of row labels down here in the lower right. I could have state, state, city. I could add a zip code. But I, that's getting carried away. Another thing you can use these for is you can use them for filters. So for example, I can put the state as a report filter. And up here in the upper left it says state all. And that's a drop down menu. And if I pull that menu down, I can see the list of states. And suppose I want my table to only show Maine. Okay, I cl click on ME for Maine. And now all I've got is the data for Maine. And whoa, there's a lot of cities for Maine. And there were 934 um, of the 1,000 rows that were in the state of Maine. And these are all the different cities. So I could change this to show only California, and I should see only six cities. Okay? So you have tremendous flexibility in your display in your pivot tables. And this allows you to pull up different kinds of data and organize it in different ways. And you know, for a, this is a small data set. It's only 1,000 rows by 30 columns. So it's really fast. You can see it's just instantaneous. If you have a really big set of data like uh, 200,000 rows, it, it's going to be little, some little delays. But that's the main, um, <clears throat> that's, you know, that's one of the, the features that is so easy to manipulate and to organize the data that, in ways that are interesting to you. Um, another thing it does is it's very easy to, it's very well integrated with graphs. So I could like select this data, and then I can go Alt, uh, N for insert, C for column, and get a column graph. And there, I have uh, my six rows. And oh, I, it's showing. Let's let's change this to a um, line graph because that's a little confusing. It pulled up both the col It pulled up two columns of data. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not what I wanted to do. Change chart type. Let's make this be a line graph. Oh, there's a lot of blanks. Okay, so type three and type five. Okay, and um, now I'll show you something interesting. Let's go into the data. Let's go to the top. Let's change Second Baptist Church of Palmer, New York, to Palmer, California. Okay. And I still have my 7. Now I've just changed the data underneath this pivot table, so I need to refresh the data. So I do Alt A for data, R for refresh all, A for refresh all, and suddenly I see Palmer, California. I've just added it to my data, and I now have 8 nonprofits in the uh, state of California. And Palmer appears in the graph. Um, it, I didn't have a, a group number, I guess. So you can see how everything's tied together and is very highly integrated. So um, I think that's it. I, that was everything I wanted to show you about pivot tables. So it's it's you know it's very intuitive. You can, if you can get the pivot table to come up and show on the screen, you can just poke around and you can figure out how to make it work. So are we going to open up the floor for questions. Yeah, we do have a we do have a couple of questions that have come in, or quite a few questions that have come in. I'll go ahead and um, ask a couple now, and then we'll go ahead and let Kate do her thing, and then um, see what questions we can get to at the end as well. Um, one thing that we were asked was if you could show how to insert a pivot table without the keyboard shortcut, so using um, a different different route than using an actual keyboard shortcut to insert the pivot table. Uh, that's a good question because I'm so used to using keyboard shortcuts I don't remember the routes. Uh, I was, that's what I was trying to show you earlier. Um, let's, see, let's, let's select the data again. It was data. Uh, oh, well, it's maybe it's insert. Insert pivot table. Yeah, so there's insert pivot table. There you go. That's what it is. Okay. Great. Okay. 
I knew it was someplace, but I, it's like I've been using shortcuts for so long, I, I don't, never use it, so I had forgotten what it was. <laughs> so I learned all this stuff on, on, in Office 2003, and, some, and the user interface has changed. So I'm still using 2003 commands very often instead of Office 2010. You had another question? Um, we did get a couple of questions. Susan was asking, how are you putting the fields in each box below? Are you doing that as a drag and drop? Yeah, I was dragging. Um, there's, there's various ways you can do it, but I was just like dragging. Uh, so I grab it, click down, and drag it over. But uh, the, you could just double click, I think, or click, and it automatically puts it someplace, or you can drag it from this corner. I'm dragging it now to another corner. So there's various ways you can do it. Very typical uh, kind of user interface. Okay, great. And then we had another question that was just about um, Excel in general. And if we have time, you can go ahead and try to show this. And if not, we can. Um, I can go ahead and try to find a answer to send this person later. But Susan was wondering um, how to copy spreadsheets and preserve the formatting, or apply formatting from one sheet or column to another? Oh, I'm, I'm fiddling with my mute button. Sorry. Um, there's, so like suppose I, uh, let's, let's go over here. Uh, assets. I haven't got any assets that are worth seeing. Let's turn Let's turn this into a dollar. Okay. So I've got this formatted. These are as money. Okay. I could then copy this. I'm using a shortcut. I'm copying. I could come over here. Now I want to set this one up to the same format. And let's see. Uh, home. Uh, copy, cut, paste. Uh, paste values of the paste options, formatting. So here, like this paste formatting, okay? Let's see what happens. You see, it pasted, it didn't change the values, this one state of one, but it gave it the formatting that I pasted in. So under paste, there are all these different other paste options, formatting, uh, a link, a picture, so there's special ways of pasting, or you can just paste the values. So I actually use that quite a bit. I do. I use paste value sometimes. I use paste formatting sometimes. It's, there's, there's both useful commands. Okay, great. So I think that the rest of the questions, um, the rest of the questions, we'll go ahead and get to after Kate's section. But I do want to make sure that Kate has enough time for her. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to her first slide. And if the um, operator could go ahead and unmute Kate at this point, that would be great. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Liberstein. I'm a finance manager at Microsoft, and I also sit on the board of directors of Seed First, which is a um, Seattle-based nonprofit organization. And they were the beneficiary of the strategic scorecard, uh, about which we will talk a little bit more in depth. Um, let me move to the next slide. Um, so I will give you a little bit of an overview of what Seed First does, uh, which will help understand the scorecard um, metrics a little bit better. Um, so Seed First is, is a um, pedestrian advocacy uh, group uh, based in Seattle, and we focus on issues such as transportation, uh, public health, um, neighborhood design, as well as environment and social justice. And there are a number of projects that Seed First gets involved in, um, among which are um, something called Safe Routes to School, which, through which we help local um, uh, middle schools and um, uh, local schools uh, help design um, the premises around the school in a way that keeps the kids safe and allows them to walk around the um, area without parents having to worry as much. Um, we also have something called uh, community maps, um, walking maps for various neighborhoods that 
allow folks to explore different neighborhoods on foot as well as use it for transportation. Um, we also get involved in a variety of you know, pedestrian advocacy um, issues um, that take in place um, where we either provide our support or you know, offer um, uh, dissenting opinions <laughs> on various policy decisions. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of an overarching uh, view. Um, so just to give a um, general sense of the mission, the organization is to promote walkable communities um, because we believe it um, that walking every day is good for your health, transportation, environment, community, and pleasure. Uh, we're a very small organization. Uh, we currently have four full staff members um, and a few part-time uh, staff members and uh, ten board members. So my um, involvement with Feed First began actually as part of a um, consultancy project. So it was um, I first learned of Feed First in 2009, and um, in February of that year, Feed First undertook a two-day strategic planning forum with the board and staff um, to help them identify their new mission, vision, values, and goals. And once they have done that, um, they have um, invited Taproot uh, Foundation, which is the um, consultancy uh, nonprofit, to help them create a strategic scorecard, which would then provide a consistent and effective way to communicate with the board on a quarterly basis. It would also help uh, facilitate annual tune-ups of the strategic plan to make sure that all of the different aspects that were identified during the planning forum are still relevant, um, you know, depending on um, developments, as well as help make sure that the plan stays alive that all the things that have been identified um, that we keep a focus on, on those areas to make sure that all the, all the good things that we as an organization want to accomplish, you, you know, we, keep, um, we keep our eye on. So um, the next slide um, gives you a, um, the six goals that were identified during the strategic planning process uh, that organization uh, took on and that we, um, when I was part of the consulting uh, team, had to kind of take in and figure out how do we use them to create a scorecard. So, you know, just high level, um, you know, among these goals were you know, identifying and empowering community leaders to um, take action that would help promote walkable communities. Um, you know, informing and motivating policymakers to prioritize funding that would support um, walkability efforts. Um, and energizing and informing community about walkability issues, um, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of taking these high level goals and then uh, figuring out how do you um, break them down into um, various objectives, how do you measure them, what kind of targets you set, and how you then take that and come up with initiatives um, to stay on uh, top of the plan. Um, so I'll just the next slide um, should appear in a second. So, what the scorecard really allows an organization to do is it provides a summary of progress toward reaching its strategic goals, and you know it is geared toward um, a review by the board on a quarterly basis. Um, so, we could um, it, it would uh, allow the board to measure and monitor strategic execution across four performance perspectives. Um, that would then provide holistic and balanced field organizational uh, strategic progress. So the four perspectives that we um, focused on were financial, um, internal processes, stakeholder, and learning and growth. Um, this would then help organization keep the strategic plan at the top of their mind, allow, it, allow them to measure their progress um, quarter over quarter, as well as against the targets that were set. Um, also focus on draw, draw out goals that are not necessarily explicit, but that the organization lives by, uh, which is important. Um, it also gives a common language to discuss organizational progress. Um, and you know, in a way, Excel plays an important role here because there are a lot of um, visualization features that make it much easier to understand um, where the organization um, is in terms of where, versus where it wants to be. Um, Let's see. Um, it also gives a way to, you know, there are a lot of different aspects that are, each nonprofit is involved in, but you want to focus on a few that are big picture, and that 
helps you figure out um, how healthy your organization is. Um, and then finally, um, it allows it provides clarity to the organization how their efforts, um, how the efforts, every day to day work that the staff does actually helps them um, toward the the long range plan that they set. So the next slide will give you a sort of a, an example of what this scorecard looks like. Um, and you can see that it's uh, broken out into the four um, the um, the four objectives that I mentioned. So financial, stakeholder, internal process, and learning and growth. Then within each of those objectives, there are a variety of measures that we wanted to um, drill into. So what I'll do right now is actually share my screen with you so that you can see um, I can kind of walk you through the different line items. Um, let's do this one second. Share that stuff. So um, you all should be seeing the Excel file itself that we used for to create the strategic scorecard. So what the view that you currently see is the output file, and really this is what uh, the board we would then present to the board and what um, the executive director of Seed First would uh, take over and then present the board on a quarterly uh, basis after the consulting project was over. So um, again, you can see the financial objective. Within it, there, is, there are a couple measures that we focused on. Um, for example, increase unrestricted funding sources and achieve revenue goals, uh, or better track and control costs. Within each of those, we then had several um, measures, um, which are, um, for example, you know, memberships or unrestricted grants or fee-for-service dollars. And then you can see the targets that we set working with the organization first. So for example, um, you know, Feed First help identify what is the high target for member fees for each quarter and what is the low target. And then we pull, would, uh, they would be able to pull in what the actual number was in terms of the member uh, membership dollars. Um, for example, so we here show two quarters for comparison purposes. And then uh, Excel there is a feature called um, conditional formatting, which allows you to then use these you know, co uh, color coding to see, okay, relative to um, the target, how are we doing, and relative to prior quarter, how are we doing. So for example, we said, okay, if our member fees um, in particular quarter were above our high target, um, then the circle would be green. If it were below the low target, the circle would be red, and if it was in between, it would be yellow. So in this case, it was yellow in both quarters. And then um, here we set up a simple formula that allows you to say compare quarter over quarter and say, okay, um, you know, if current quarter is above the prior quarter, then show an up um, arrow. If it's below, then show a down pointing arrow, and if it's same, then show an equal sign. But again, when the board looks at it, they don't need to think through all these details. They can just take a look and see, okay, so it looks like our membership fees have gone down in a particular quarter. Um, so what kind of uh, decisions should we make based on that? And you know, first of all, we can drill down into potential reasons, and then you know, what are some of the initiatives that would fall uh, uh, out of that particular um, um, takeaway. And you know, the same is done for the uh, year to date so that you can see not only how you are doing on a quarterly basis, but how you are doing um, on an annual basis, how are you progressing towards your annual goal. And so um, again, this all, we chose to do this in Excel because we felt that this is a relatively simple way of doing it and it will be, would be easy for the organization with small staff and limited resources to maintain. Um, and it would be easy for the board then to take a look and see um, where the organization is and what kind of actions need to be taken. Now, as I mentioned before, this is an output page, so th th there's a lot of data that supports it. And so I'll just briefly walk you through how we set it up. Um, so we had a collection plan that um, gives a summary of where different pieces of information would come from. So for example, for the financial section, um, a lot of the data would be kept either in QuickBooks, accounting system, or in Salesforce, for example. So 
that's when staff sort this out on a quarterly basis, they um, can easily find um, where the data is housed. And then uh, if we go to the so each tab here, it corresponds to a particular measure that then feeds into the scorecard. So for example, if you look at the financial tab, these are the different measures that we looked at. Uh, membership fees, unrestricted grants, restricted grants, and fee for service. So um, on a monthly or quarterly basis, uh, staff um, or someone in an organization would fill out this, um, just do a data dump uh, from another system that organization uses without having to you know, do a lot of work. And then there is a formula set up to say, okay, pool, you know, for example, here it will say look up for, look for you know, the X which indicates where, what time period we are in. And then you know, pull the number that corresponds to that time period. So here you see um, 4900. So if we go back to the scorecard, you see that 4900 here. And of course, if I were to move the X to a different time period, it would adjust. So which makes uh, updating the scorecard very simple. So um, I mean, this is a high level of, of, of how we approach this um, project. Um, and then, of course, you know each corresponding tab um, does a very similar thing depending on what measure we were looking at. Um, and all of these are outlined in the um, in the output page, which is the scorecard. And to this day, the organization uses it. Um, we've changed some of these parameters, some of the measures, because again, if we see, for example, that quarter over quarter the circles are red, then either we are not focusing on some of the areas because something else is a higher priority and maybe it shouldn't be one of our strategic goals, or you know, we need to uh, invest a lot more time and resources into making sure that um, we are as an organization putting um, staff time into you know, improving um, how we are doing against those targets. Or another reason could be that the targets are not reasonable. For example, maybe our high target is too high, or maybe it's too low. So these kind of this is the kind of thought process that the board can go through, just looking at something as simple as this that Excel allows us to do. Um, so th this is high level overview. Um, please let me know if there are questions that I can answer. But I think this is a good illustration of how Excel. Can be a really useful tool for both um, for big, big, big uh, picture thinking as well as um, drilling into specific um, data sets and understanding root causes of any problems or uh, understanding reasons for success. Kate, I know we had um, at least one question that was just wanting you to go a little bit more into the process that was used to create it. And, um, this the same person was wondering if you could include a screenshot or sample, um, even without data, for the scorecard categories. Uh, sure, one second. Let me. If this person, um, she was wondering how you developed the four parts and the subsections under each, more specifically. Uh, sure. Um, let me just okay. Let's go back to the scorecard. So. We've used, in terms of figuring out the four um, uh, the four categories, we've used certain literature um, that sort of helped us think through how the different um, measures the organization uh, focuses on. You know, what are the sorry, what are the different core objectives? And really, you know, a sta really stakeholder is where you know is the outcome of the mission of the organization. So if what we're trying if our mission is to promote walkable communities, then you know stakeholder, for example, generating enthusiasm for walking would be an important one. Expanding relationships with community leaders and elected officials would be an important one because they they're the folks that provide funding that can support a lot of the initiatives that we'd like to take on and see happen um, in our community. Expanding membership is important because the more members we have in the organization, the more supporters we have, the more the issues are being talked about, um, the more they show up in the press, and I guess the, the higher the rate of change that we will see or you know, better improvements. And you know, for another one we had here is increased diversity of members and communities served. Again, um, this is um, it was actually an interesting discussion in terms of you know who the stakeholders are because it's almost um, 
being a pedestrian is kind of an interesting thing because everybody is a pedestrian. You know, a biker is something you choose to be, but a pedestrian is something that we all are at some point in our day or in our week or month. At some point, we do have to walk places. And so it actually opens up a lot of opportunities of, you know, getting not not necessarily uh, segmenting the markets to, you know, who is, you know, the bikers only, for example, but it's really they're all, it's, it's really understanding what's important to different people. So when you think about parents, safe routes to school would be very important to them because they worry about the safety of their children. Uh, when you think about, you know, people who commute to work a lot, um, you know, having a a good transit system and having uh, walking maps that allow them to, you know, find ways to get where they need to be without using the car is important to them. Um, in terms of, um, elect, you know, in terms of um, policies, again, um, the more support we have from the community uh, about some, some of these issues, the more um, elected officials would pay attention to the, you know, areas of concern. So it's really, you know, taking those four. Um, objectives, financial stakeholder, internal process, and learn and growth, which we, you know, uh, we came up with from just reading and understanding, uh, you know, how organizations, how uh, nonprofit organizations operate, and then kind of within each working with feet first to understand what are the important measures that need to be addressed. And then, you know, drilling in a little more and saying, okay, you know, what are the different um, sub-measures, if you will, that help uh, support each of those layers, um, if that helps. In terms of, um, you mentioned something uh, about a snapshot. Um, what kind of snapshot should I offer? Um, I, I think she was just question. wondering if um, there was a snapshot, let me take a look at the question really quick, if there was a screenshot or sample of the scorecard categories. Um, and if you could even email that to me later, because I know we're we're getting low on time, and I do want to make sure okay, that sure. we, uh, yeah, sure. And that way I can forward yeah, that along. Yeah, we can along. definitely do that. But uh, on one of the slides um, that says Feedbird Strategic Scorecard, um, all of the different measures that we um, cared about at, at the time that we created the scorecard are listed. Or okay. That we either uh, that or, so we had more, but th those are the ones that we narrowed down and kept. Okay. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and then with that, if you want to go ahead and get back to the um, the slide deck by just pressing the um, the green arrow at the top, it's at the very top of the screen. Uh, okay, see, so got you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> fine, fine. Okay. And if you want, if so you have any closing, yeah. And so this uh, last slide was just an example of the model structure which I walked you through in the model itself. So you can see the different tabs um, that we had which correspond to the different measures that you see on slide 31 um, and, um, and kind of the how we organize it um, to feed into the output uh, page that then is used for presentation purposes. Okay, great, thanks. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look to see what other questions have come in. Um, we probably won't get to all of the questions that have come in today, um, but never fear, I will be forwarding those questions to the presenters after the fact, and we will get you an answer at some point. Um, we did have some questions that were that I wanted to bring up that were unrelated to either you know pivot tables or to the strategic scorecard that Kate just talked about, um, and I thought it would be good to to, to talk a little bit about those. We did ha have a question about um, how to create specific formulas. So for example, um, we had a question asking, what do you do to subtract a number from the total, such as you do an auto sum for various fundraising items, then you have, to then you have a corresponding auto sum for expenses, and you want to have the net amount. I'm not sure maybe if Mark wants to try to take that one, and I can repeat that if you need me to. Sure. So it's um, he's asking, what do you do to subtract a number from the total, and for for a formula? And his example is, you do if you do an auto sum for various fundraising items, then you have a corresponding auto sum for expenses, and but then you want to have the net amount. Um. Hmm. 
I'm not sure I really understand the question. That's, that's the problem. Could we possibly just get this in written form and I could communicate with them through email or something like that? Because that's, I'm not quite certain and I understand what he's asking. That's, that's completely fine. Um, all right, and then Paige was wondering if um, somebody could say something about setting up conditional formatting. Sure, um, I, can. I can talk about. Or, I'm not an expert at it, so if, you, if you're better at it, you can take it. <laughs> um, I can show, for example, how we've done it for um, you know the scorecards. Uh, let me let me share this my screen again. So, for example, you know we're here and we want to set up one of these circles here. So you would go to Home, and then you would go to Conditional Formatting right here. And then um, you see there are several options. You see highlight cell rules. For example, here you can choose you know, highlight a cell in particular color or a uh, font in particular color if that cell is above a certain number, if it's less than a certain number, if it's the same certain number. Um, so for example, if we choose this one and we say you know, format um, this cell uh, with I'll say yellow and dark text. Um, wait one second. All right, let's, let's do this again. So go to home, conditional formatting, highlight, break right in. So we say um, they're greater than this number with um, this text. Okay. So what you would then need to do is copy this format and you can see that this number is greater than 5718 and so it highlighted it uh, in the format that I selected. So that's just one example of how you use it. But really I mean you just have to go in here and explore the different options. Um, so data bar is another really cool way, you know, um, where you can, for example, if you have, um, um, for you know, let's say we had membership fees from different categories of members. We wanted to see the percentage of the different categories that make up that total revenue number. You know, if I had uh, if I had those listed, I could then you know use this. Um, you, I mean, you can't see this very well in here, but you can kind of have a visual representation of, you know, how, what proportion uh, came from each category. So it's really a visualization tool, um, and it's pretty simple. Um, I would say just play around with it. This is where the icons come from. So, for example, these the circles that you see. This is where that comes from. Um, I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you, Kate. And with that, I do want to go ahead and close the webinar up. Again, if your question did not get answered, I will be going ahead and forwarding those questions to the to the speakers. Um, and I will try to somehow get the um, content of the answered questions to everybody, um, so that way we can all benefit from those answers. So a little bit about who TechSoup is. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, just like so many of you. And we do try to enhance or help your organization's mission by providing technology and technology resources that you need to do that. And if you go to the TechSoup.org website, you can go ahead and go to our Learning Center or our blog to find some great written content. You can go ahead and try to find products in our Find Products section on the right for our donation programs. And don't forget to sign up for our By the Cup and New Product Donation Alert newsletters also on the right there. And I do want to take a moment just to really thank all of our presenters today, and I want to thank Microsoft for being so great in, in helping us put these webinars together. And then I also want to thank ReadyTalk, who is our webinar sponsor, um, for providing the tool that we had our webinar on today. So again, thank you everybody, and thank you Kevin and Meg who are helping us on the back end today. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Again, when you exit, you're, you're going to get a survey. And please make sure to fill that out because that does help us in creating our future webinars. 
and um, the recording and additional material should be going out later today. So thank you, everybody.